Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first video um, for this week. Um, where we're going to be continuing to talk about electrochemistry and start in on talking about cells and some of the things that we do with these electrochemical cells that we introduced last week. So um, we talked about electrochemical cells last week. This is the idea that when you do a reduction oxidation reaction, you can physically separate the two half reactions, the oxidation half and the reduction half, put them in separate reaction, uh, separate vessels in this case, in this diagram, they're beakers, um, and that causes electrons. And that, for the electrons, instead of just transferring directly from atom to atom, you can make them travel through a wire. Um, and the usefulness of that is that when they travel through that wire, they can pass through some sort of device and make it run, and, like a light bulb. And so the idea of electrochemical cells is what's underlying um, every single battery that you've ever used, every single electric electrical device um, that's ever run on power. There's a chemical reaction that's happening that underlies all of that. And so we have this uh, reduction and the oxidation. And the oxidation half the reaction, we say, happens at the anode. And so the anode um, would be the half reaction um, where you have um, that oxidation occurring. So electrons, oxidation is lost. So electrons are flowing away from there. At the same time, in this case, zinc is the electrode that we're using uh, for the anode. Um, it's going to lose mass because atoms, which are neutral, in the solid are becoming cations. So they're leaving the solid um, and going out into solution. So that mass goes down. So the electrons leave there. Uh, atoms leave the solid, become cations. Electrons flow over into the cathode, um, which is where reduction occurs. So reduction is gain. Um, reduction is happening at the cathode. Electrons come into there. And then cations from the solution um, join onto the surface of the cathode electrode. And as a result, that electrode gains mass. So you get more and more um, atoms that are in that piece of solid. Um, we can then look at, a, you know, kind of this uh, fancier in motion. Um, this is the zinc-copper reaction um, where you have a uh, zinc uh, anode and a copper cathode. This one I, is a mirror image. So the anode, the electrons are now flowing in the other direction. It's the same two half reactions, though. Um, and so that idea is you have that flow of electrons um, from back and forth. And we can see they're kind of showing, the reason why I have this is you're showing at the atomic scale what's going on. Again, those zinc atoms are leaving the solid where they're neutral and going out into solution where they become cations. And then the opposite process is happening in the copper side on that cathode. And so this image right here is showing what actually happens after you run the reaction, the zinc anode um, is then decreased in mass because that is participating in the reaction and the copper cathode um, is now larger in mass. And really what this is just corresponding to is, um, this is an old idea that we've seen previously, zinc uh, solid is a reactant in this reaction, copper solid is a product. And so the copper solid as a reactant decreases in mass over the course of the reaction and the copper cathode increases in mass as a product over the course of the reaction. Um, so those are all like fancy diagrams showing fancy cartoons. Um, I do want to note these sorts of processes, these cells, you can make it in a lab. They don't look as fancy as those cartoons imply, but it really is just two beakers. You have your zinc beaker. There's zinc two, two plus cations in solution. This is just a piece of zinc. Here you have a copper solution, that's why it's blue, and then a copper two, there's cations in there, and then this is just a piece of copper. Um, this is literally what it looks like. Um, if you have, there's wires clamped onto the uh, pieces of metal running into a voltometer in this case. Um, and then the very important piece of the puzzle um, that we haven't uh, mentioned yet is the salt bridge. And the salt bridge, uh, the purpose of that is just to balance out the reaction. Um, a salt bridge is always important or always necessary. You always have to have the electrons flow through the wires. You need to account for that charge difference. Um, you're losing electrons from the anode and they're going into the cathode. And so you have to accommodate that change in charge. And the salt bridge accomplishes that by moving uh, anions. You can see here, this is literally a wet paper towel. That paper towel has just been soaked in salt water and then draped between the two beakers. So importantly, the beaker solutions don't mix, but um, you can still have ions leave that 
paper towel and go into the two solutions. And it, it's as simple as that. Salt bridges do not need to be fancier than that. Okay, so we've defined all the parts of a cell and everything that goes into it. Um, but now we kind of want to start to talk about a little fancier kind of stuff. Um, you know, kind of applications of cells or how we can think about and use cells. And so one of the questions we could ask is, you know, how quickly do they do these electrons move? You know, why do the electrons flow from one metal to the other, right? We had zinc and copper there. We looked at a copper silver example last time. And, you know, in one case, the copper in the copper one is paired with the zinc, the electrons go to the copper. But when copper is paired with silver, the electrons flow to the silver. And why are those directions decided? Um, you know, and then that's really what we're going to get to today. Um, then we'll continue on next week talking about questions like how brightly can you make a light bulb glow or how can you make a something better, right? You say you have silver and, and copper. How can you make that silver and copper cell even better? How can you get some more electrons to come out of it? Okay, so uh, to answer these questions as to how you can get uh, electrons coming out of this drive for electrons is all about what's called electromotive force. Electromotive force is the tendency for electrons to flow between electrons. So this is the idea that there is some spontaneousness to these redox reactions, that there are electrons that are tending to move. Electromotive force, electro is electrons, motive, um, that's motion, and then force is that driving factor. So electromotive force it's going to be the description of why and how electrons are moving, um, but what's that push for electrons to flow between these electrodes. Um, we're going to describe this with what's called cell potential. So that potential is a reference to potential energy. Um, what sort of potential energy is there within the cell? The units are volts, and our symbol for the volts is going to be a capital V. Um, and one volt is one joule per coulomb. So joules are the energy units we've seen before. Coulomb, that's that capital C. A coulomb is a measurement of a unit of charge. So one coulomb is an amount of charge. Um, a mole of electrons, right? each electron is you know, negatively charged. Um, a mole's worth of electrons has a charge of 9.65 times 10 to the fourth coulomb. We'll use that number. Uh, we'll see here in a little bit. That is the coulombs per mole of electrons. So these volt units, these potential units, this is joules per coulomb. And basically we can understand that coulomb is charge. So this is energy per charge. So the idea of volts here and voltage, what you're measuring is how much energy is gained or released when this coulomb of charge transfers. So every time the electrons go, uh, every time the electrons are flowing, how much energy is gained or released from that? So the, the idea of where this electromotive force comes from, why is there a cell potential, is based off the underlying chemical function. Um, so the fact, the idea of does your cell run is based on the question of does the chemical reaction happen? And a chemical reaction, you know, would be based on whether or not a chemical reaction happens. That's describing spontaneity, and that's characterized by delta G. So the magnitude of delta G tells us um, what the size of the cell potential is. So we have an equation that's going to relate them. Delta G is equal to NFE cell. Um, so we'll take a look at these. Some of the delta G, that's just the Gibbs free energy that we've looked at. This would be of the total a redox reaction that we're doing. So the idea of balancing what the total reaction is, all of that. And then E cell, that's the description of the potential of the cell. So in these other two variables, we have little n and big F. So we'll start with the little n. That is moles of electrons transferred in the reaction. Right? So this little n um, corresponds to when we did the redox balancing, that you had some electrons that moved in the reaction, right? How many electrons left the uh, oxidation step and how many went into the uh, reduction step and how you had to get those numbers equal, that number of electrons is N, okay? That is where the N comes in. And then F, um, that capital F stands for Faraday's constant. Michael Faraday was uh, a big uh, physicist working in with electrons in charge. 
and Faraday's constant is the charge of one mole of electrons. So this is a constant we've seen similar to um, other constants we've used. Um, this value, capital F, always means the technical definition is 9.65 times 10 to the fourth coulombs per mole. Um, so it's coulombs per mole. Um, because of the relationship between volt and coulomb, it is much more common to see this description. Um, this is going to be functionally useful, and we'll see this here when we start to work through examples. Technically, Faraday's constant, the units are coulombs per mole, but functionally, it is much more common to use joules per volt mole, um, where you have those volts and joules. That's just uh, using uh, this definition we had right here. Uh, you're just rearranging. We know that one volt is one joule per one coulomb. You're just rearranging that into one coulomb is equal to one joule per one volt. And so that's the more common description that we use for Faraday's constant units. But these are the same numbers. You're just substituting in what cou coulombs or joules or volts all are. All right, so. Let's do an example. Let's see this in action. For the reaction, Cu plus Ag plus goes to Cu2 plus plus Ag solid. E cell is equal to 0 0.46 volts. What is the delta G for this reaction? So we're going to get into how we come up with these E cells, where these potentials come from. But for now, we're just going to see how it works. Okay. Okay. So I've got this reaction, um, and I've got the E cell, and I want to know delta G. And so we know that delta G. We've I've seen other ways to calculate delta G. We know off of tabulated information, that kind of stuff. One of the indications that you probably won't be able to find tabulated information about this is that these are ions. So this net ionic equation, um, ions tend to not have tabulated information. Some of them do, but those experiments are really, really difficult to do, uh, unlike neutral compounds. And so it's uncommon to get ionic tabulated information for delta G. It's possible, um, but it's not going to be there for everything. Um, so it's unlikely that we'll use the sort of tables of thermodynamic information for delta G, but we are given E cell. And whenever we want to write E cell and delta G, our equation becomes delta G is equal to negative N F E cell. So delta G is what we want. We are explicitly given E cell. So then the question is, what is N and what F? Well, F is a constant. So that's 9.65 times 10 to the fourth Coulomb per mole. We can always look that up. We want to recognize capital F is a constant. So then the question becomes, what about that N? And the N comes from balancing. The N comes from the question of how many electrons are moved in this electrochemical reaction that we're looking at. And what we can do is we can look at the half reactions. We know I have copper solid becoming copper 2 plus. And then we have Ag plus becoming Ag solid. And so we know that this needs to balance that zero charge. That's positive two. So I need two electrons on that side. This is plus one. That's zero. So I need one electron on this side. Okay. So those two numbers aren't equal. And so when I want to come up with the value for n, that's the same thing as asking this question of how do I make these equal? Well, I'm going to need to multiply this one by 2. And then I can see I have 2 right here and 2 right here. So what that means is that n is equal to 2.
whenever we want to get n, it has to follow from balancing the redox reaction. That number of electrons out, which has to be equal to the number of electrons in. It's once you make those numbers equal, whatever that value is, that's your n. All right, so let's plug everything in. Delta G is negative 2 times 9.65 times 10 to the 4th Coulomb per mole times, let's do the potential right there, 0 0.46 volts. And so if we look here, we can see I got coulombs, moles, and volts. Those units are going to cancel out. And so that's why we generally don't use this coulomb. We know that coulomb is joule per volt. So it's more useful to rewrite this as 2, then I said 9 to 5, 10 to the 4th. The number doesn't change but it becomes joules per volt times mole, and then the 0 0.46 volts. So then, if I enumerate, to evaluate that, 89,000, the volts cancel out. And so then I get 89,000 joules per mole, which I turn to negative 89 kilojoules per mole. Get the pen out of the way. So we can see this equation, delta G is equal to negative NFE, always is going to be what allows us to go back and forth between these here. All right, now that we've computed delta G, we can start to interpret it. This is delta G right here, right? Negative 89 kilojoules per mole. That is a negative number. Because that's a negative number, this chemical reaction is spontaneous. Okay, so because the delta G is a negative number, this chemical reaction is spontaneous, and that means E cell positive corresponds to a spontaneous cell. So the question of why do electrons flow from copper to silver is because that is the spontaneous direction. An E cell shows positive. That's why the electrons flow that direction, because that's the direction where delta G is negative. That is the spontaneous direction. Okay, sorry for that flash. So when, and also not only that, but we can see that not only the sign consistent, but as delta G becomes more negative, the cell potential becomes more positive. So the cell potential becomes more positive. There's more and more energy per coulomb, more volts. So there is more push for those electrons to flow from the anode to the cathode. Right? In order for this chemical reaction to actually occur, those electrons have to go from between those reactant at, uh, between the reactant atoms. So we need to get that actual transfer. So as that E cell becomes more and more positive, there's more and more driving force for those electrons to get between those reactants, which means there's more and more force pushing those electrons through that wire. Right, there's more and more tendency for the electrons to flow into that wire, flow through, and get onto that other reactant to do the actual oxidation. Leave the copper and go to the silver cations. And so there's more and more push, so they can work 
more and more, to, they'll, they're willing to work more and more to get there. You can have brighter lights, you can do all sorts of things. So it's all about the underlying chemical reaction that drives why do electrons flow? Because the chemistry is spontaneous. Okay, so participation question one for the reaction. I got magnesium solid plus cadmium two plus aqueous goes to magnesium two plus solid. I noticed I made this mistake. Um, that should say aqueous uh, plus cadmium solid. It was the same mistake on the last one. You can tell I copy pasted. Um, delta G is equal to negative 380.2 kilojoules per mole. What is E cell for this reaction? So this is question one of participation assignment six. For the reaction magnesium solid plus cadmium two plus aqueous goes to magnesium two plus aqueous plus cadmium solid. Delta G is equal to negative 380.2 kilojoules per mole. What is E cell for this reaction? Uh, so that's question one for participation six. I uh, wanna make sure you get that answer up on Blackboard. It's due Wednesday, April 15th at 11.55 p.m. So that's gonna bring us to our first uh, uh, end end of our first video. Um, you got participation assignment six. Sorry, that's a typo there. That should not be the 14th. That should be the 15th. Um, ooh, all sorts of problems. Midweek homework 12 is not due Sunday. Um, that's due Thursday, which is also not April 12th. Um, that's probably what, April 16th? Um, woof, I am all this messed up april 15th all over the place the test information is correct uh so test three is later this week thursday april 16th at noon until saturday april 18th at 11 55 p.m i want to upload your work for partial credit you can upload a review to get five bonus points um if you have any questions about any of that stuff uh please uh, uh let me know uh, if you have any anything like that otherwise we got a couple more videos uh for this uh, if you have any questions let me know otherwise i'll see you in those videos